Hello, and welcome to this week's Innovation Coffee brought to you by ARM. In today's episode, we'll be speaking with Pete Bernard, Senior Director, Silicon and Telecom for Microsoft Azure Edge Devices, also known as Digital Dad on Twitter. We will get to know Pete, do a fun icebreaker round of Innovation Coffee Cribs. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this one. We have a really cool demo, and then we'll dive in to some juicy Edge AI topics with Microsoft Azure Edge. But before we bring out our esteemed guests, let's quickly revisit last week's episode with Kitty Young. Last week, we met with Kitty, who happens to also be one of our amazing ARM innovators, to talk about tech and fashion. Not only did we get to see a bunch of really cool fashionable tech demos that she has created, but she also announced the launch of a Kickstarter that has now been running for an entire week. And it just so happens that she's about $80 away from hitting her goal. So if you're interested in a cool gift for your significant other or a friend, or just want to support Kitty and her amazing creations, head on over to her Kickstarter and show some love. We will post the link in the chat right now. I have chats on that side, I think. All right. As a reminder, if you have any questions during the stream for myself or for our guest, please feel free to drop that in the chat and we'll get to them as soon as possible. If you're watching this on demand and you have questions, drop them in the comments section as we also monitor engagements there as well. Now, don't forget, if you like the video, smash that like button. It's the thumbs up there on your screen right below the video. Follow us on the ARM Software Developers YouTube channel because we're constantly releasing new developer content here. So... Without further delay, let's bring Pete Bernard onto the stream. So hello, Pete, and welcome to Arms Innovation Coffee. Let's see if we can get him in here. Boom. Added to the stream. Hi. (laughs) Hello. I made it. Yes, welcome. And there you go. We we posted Digital Dad right there. Really cool, really cool uh, Twitter feed. Check that one out. Pete, welcome to Innovation Coffee. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, great. Great to be here. Appreciate uh, spending some time talking to your developer community. Awesome, awesome, yeah. So um, one of the things we like to do here at the very beginning, and I, gosh, I, I'm, I, I'm admiring your background. Looks like you have some really cool <laughs> instruments. We, oh we wanna get to we wanna get to know our guests, right? So like, what do you do? What's, what are your passions? I'm guessing some music. Maybe you can share something personal about yourself as well as something professional. Sure. Uh, yeah, sure. Well, this is my my little office here that I've been c- curating for the past year. Um, I guess you can see my guitars on the back wall. I've got like an old uh, Fender Silverface amp down there. So yeah, I'm into playing music and uh, uh, doing that. And, you know, been living here in uh, the North, great Northwest for about 16 years. Uh, and that's been a lot of fun as well. And I've got my Azure Percept dev kit on my desk. And we can talk about that a little bit today, which is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, you know, just little bits and bobs around here. Comfy awesome. chair back there. Awesome. Awesome. Could you tell us a little bit about what you do with Microsoft Azure, what you do for Microsoft? Yeah, sure. So uh, it's uh, the name of the group is called Azure Edge Devices, Platforms and Services, or we call AD Plus. And uh, we are part of the kind of Azure engineering org, uh, really focused on a lot of the interesting things that connect to Azure. Uh, You know, how do we develop platforms and services to help uh, critical devices connect to Azure and help our customers get things done. And probably the, the the key element there is around Edge AI and how that is really transforming a lot of uh, solutions out there. And my team specifically, the Silicon and Telco team is pretty self-explanatory. We work with Silicon partnerships like Arm as well as others. And we also work with a lot of our uh, key Telco partners and technologies around 5G and LPWA, trying to find kind of the intersection of 5G, Edge and AI and doing something really amazing with that for our customers as well. So, so we have a, it's, it's, it's funny, like, of course, right at this exact time, the, the, there's a leaf blower going on right outside. Oh. Like, I don't know if you all can hear it, but I can hear it very loud. Okay. Um, it's, it's coming up. We have a really fun segment. You kind of gave us a little bit of a, of a teaser there, but let's take a look at your desk. Oh, okay. Can, out? can you see my like, desk? Probably not. No. Can we go? Let's do that. Oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Pete, 
What this yes. this is a fun little segment we do. It's called Innovation Coffee Cribs. Um, we want to hear about the things you have on your desk. A lot of times, you know, the camera's facing you. It's not usually yeah. on your desk. So, what kind of cool stuff you have to show us? Well, let's see. I've got my Yeti coffee mug. So this is what's special about this mug. It's a double double cup. So and it's thermal. So I can go. I can put two cups in there and be good all morning, which is good. Big, big, big here in the Seattle area is the coffee thing. I mentioned before my Azure Percept dev kit. We'll talk about that later. Um, I actually kind of just re put some stuff together. So I don't have as much stuff on my desk as I used to. I got my Samsung uh, um, Galaxy Note 5G Plus. I don't even know what the name of it is. It's a, some huge giant phone, the Ultra, which is pretty cool. And uh, I've got my Sennheiser headphones down here and my little audio equipment. You know, that's fun. That's fun. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I'm admiring your guitars still that are behind you. I used to I used to play a lot more guitar than I do now. Um, just a, a, a quick one here. I used to have a, a Fender American Standard Strat, Aqua yeah. Metallic, uh, old school as well. I had the ESP M1 Custom single piece. I can't find that guitar anymore under like mm. two three thousand dollars. But I bought it for like four hundred bucks back back in yeah. the day. And then the Gibson Les Paul Studio. So those, oh, those are yeah. my three, and uh, yeah. I used to jam out a lot. Um, I used to, well, I rotate these behind me. I have a few guitars. So one of them is a 65 Mustang. That's oh the red my gosh. one oh my gosh. Uh, that I bought in college off a guy who was going off to the Peace Corps, and he had to liquidate his equipment. So I, I got a good deal on that. And then there's a – the white one is a 79 Stratocaster, uh, American Stratocaster. That's kind of like my – go to uh but i've got i got more in the closet i, I kind of just kind of rotate them out here here and there but uh, i play nice good. nice nice I, i'll have to go visit you in seattle and <laughs> <out there. laughs> yeah, sure. get to try some of these unique guitars that, that, that many people don't even get to try cool so diving into our main segment now pete we're yep. going to talk about microsoft azure edge ai okay um I'm, I'm curious because one of the first things here is uh we want to talk about Microsoft a little bit. You guys just celebrated yeah. the 46th, your 46th birthday? Apparently, yeah. So I've been with the company 16 years. Uh, actually, my start day is apparently the birthday, the Microsoft birthday as well. So uh, although I, I started 16 years ago, not 46 years ago, thank God. But yeah, Microsoft's <laughs> been around, you know, I mean, I wouldn't say forever, but literally forever. In fact, today was the big Windows 11 thing that I just watched. So hopefully your, your uh, listeners and viewers can check that out too. But yeah, been at Microsoft a long time. And uh, it's amazing. Like, you know, when I was growing up, you know, working on my TRS-80 and all that other stuff, uh, you know, I knew what Microsoft was and, you know, I, I guess I hadn't really visualized working here, but I guess I've been doing software stuff since, since I was a teenager, like, like a lot of people. And, you know, coming into this organization and the company, uh, it's just so vast and there's so many things going on. And one of the cool things is you work with so many talented people here that have been here for a while or brought some incredible expertise, whether it's gaming or, you know, cellular or power or architecture. I mean, so it's kind of a, you're kind of like a kid in a candy store working at Microsoft if you're into tech. Microsoft is one of the pioneers. I mean, I remember working uh, my first computer. It was, of course, MS-DOS. Right. I right. was running MS DOS. Right. You want to open your games. You got a CD into the file and then open yeah. it, execute it. And then when Windows 3.0 came out, like the first actual desktop, I was like, oh my God, what is this? Yeah. And I was, I was fortunate enough to be a kid who had one of those. Um, but Microsoft, I think in general, Microsoft Windows, these things were like stapled into my childhood. Right. Right. Uh, so it's so cool to see 46 years. I mean, it's crazy. Arm's been around for 30 years. You've been working at Microsoft for 16 years, 46 minus 30. There you go. Mm -hmm. There's the, there's the 16. There it's just yeah. a coincidence. <laughs> yeah, no, and there's just so much uh, history there and, uh, and learnings too. You know, I mean, the, the, the way things have evolved from the edge to the cloud and now, you know, the edge, the edge has become a, a thing again and, um, you know, hardware has become cool again. Yes. Uh, and, you know, the pendulum swings uh, back and forth and, you know, What's been interesting is now that there's so much more compute horsepower and and network capability, new new cap new things are being unlocked, right? That you just couldn't do before. And so a lot of the ideas we had maybe 10, 15 years ago that we all tried and it was kind of like hacky and not too good. Now it's like you can actually do it. And you know, you can actually do some really cool, amazing things 
that just because of the horsepower and the bandwidth you could you couldn't do before it's crazy you mentioned this right like i've been going on a binge of these old er, i say old right like early 2000s movies <laughs> which is old now um early 2000s and you see some of the things that these people have to go through it's like they come across a clue and they don't just pull their phone out and snap a picture of it right like they they're still using pen and paper and you know like drawing oh, yeah. and, and i'm just like wow like this is just 20 years i mean 80 or 40 years ago you know 46 years ago we're talking about when microsoft was founded and here you go you know, even just 20 years ago, they couldn't even pull their phone out and take a picture. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, compute at the edge is definitely something that I think, uh, you know, if you go into just 20 years ago, all the ideas, like you mentioned, you come up with something, you can't create it yet. But now here we exactly. are at a point where things can be created. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. started my career as a uh, bios engineer, actually at Phoenix Technologies. If anyone remembers when you power up a PC and it says Phoenix uh, bios. So uh I graduated Boston University. I was in the Boston area. I was working for a professor of mine, assembly language professor. I was kind of, sort of quasi unemployed. And so this opportunity to work at Phoenix was pretty cool. And that was, you know, at the time, sort of the gateway to all of these PC manufacturers uh, and, you know, writing firmware and, you know, booting up the OS and doing all that stuff. And to a certain extent, I feel like I'm sort of doing the same thing. I'm still working with software where it meets hardware and enabling, you know, uh, all these kind of new, what we call edge, we just call it embedded, then we call it IOT, and now we call it edge. But sometimes, like, I feel like I'm doing the same job, but the whole world is just keeps evolving around me. But, um, you know, that's me. There's a I shot JR just saying that he recently set up a <laughs> Win95 machine. Gosh, nice. that's gotta be a blast from the past right there. Nice. Um, cool. Yeah, very cool. So Pete, uh, I'm 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 told to mention here about the IoT Unicorn podcast with oh, yeah. uh, some, someone from from actually within Arm as well, Renee Haas. So yes. I'm I'm curious, could you tell us a little bit about this IoT Unicorn podcast? Yeah, so I uh, I started it last year, like a lot of folks, um, and you know part of it was I'm having lots of interesting conversations with partners and uh, you know kind of talking a little history, but also kind of where all this is heading and. Uh, so someone at Microsoft was like, well, you should just record those and make a podcast out of them. So I did that. Um, and I had Renee on there, who's, I think, is he the president of Arm IP these days? I'm not sure. He, he's kind of the... He's up there. Yeah. He's a chief <laughs> dude. But, uh, and I had known Renee because I worked on some uh, Windows on Arm Qualcomm stuff uh, prior to this current role. And yeah, we had a good, nice chat. Uh, talking about our partnership with Microsoft. I think we talked a little bit about Pink Floyd and some other cool topics uh, that we had in common. And um, so, yeah, so the, the podcast, it's kind of a little bit on hiatus right now because I just got overwhelmed uh, with work, but I plan on bringing some form of that back. But yeah, if you go out there and search for IoT Unicorn, there's some good episodes. And we've got ARM on there. Right there. Yeah, there you go. So it's got uh, ARMS on there, Qualcomm, uh, NXP, Intel, uh, you know, all kinds of different folks kind of in the space and uh, talking about where things are heading. So that was a lot and of fun. And this is, this is an audio podcast? Yeah, it's just audio. Yeah, yeah. I, so I, I, had, no, I, I had no idea about this. Like, I'm definitely going to go check it out. And I mean, Renee's an awesome, awesome guy. And you, I'm just meeting you. You seem like an awesome guy. This sounds like it's going to be an amazing podcast. I think it's going to yeah, end up. So it was a lot of fun. It was a lot of fun. And, uh, uh, but, you know, it is it is work. I mean, I, you know, I appreciate, you know, on the other side of the microphone where you're at, because, you know, you got to get the guests and the topics and the production. And it's it's it takes a lot of time. And uh, but it's you know, I think when it works, it could be super useful uh, to try to kind of get that information out there, especially in an audio or video form uh, where we don't know how we're, we're kind of on the move. It's hard to read stuff. And yeah. uh, sometimes those conversations can really spark some interesting ideas. So. Fun. Yeah, I'm very fortunate to have folks behind the scenes. So I'll send a big thank you to the folks behind the scenes right. for helping yeah. us out here. Um, but yeah, definitely uh, doing these things. Of course, it, it is some work. Um, yeah. One thing I was going to say here, which I hope I'm not forgetting right now. I have forgotten it. Um, okay. It's okay, though. <laughs> so, so Pete, Let's move on to this next question here. We were talking about Microsoft being around 46 years. Could you share some highlights, some stats from the last 46 years with Microsoft? Well, there's a lot in there. Uh, <laughs> uh, I mean, we've seen the company change a lot. I think the company has always been kind of a platform company, uh, platform and tools. I, I kind of jokingly refer to it as a humble platform and tool company. 
Uh, but really, that's really what we're all about. And in fact, if you saw the Windows 11 announcements today, and what Sati was talking about is, I think we do our best work when we are providing a platform for others to really do cool stuff, um, whether that's Windows or Azure or you know w whatever our our systems are. That's really what the company's been about. And so, um, and at the same time, we've grown these incredible businesses like Xbox and Surface. And, uh, and, you know, a couple of clunkers in there. I've worked on a few of those. Uh, I've got my box of, um, you know, uh, antiquated hardware that, that uh, didn't, didn't ship. But, uh, you know, that's part of the fun. But I think Microsoft, you know, has been kind of woven into the DNA of tech for decades right now. And oh, yeah. uh, I think one of the cool things we're seeing, and we use this term digital transformation, um, but a lot of companies, you know, are really trying to, and have to kind of reinvent themselves. I mean, they had to prior to the pandemic. And then during the pandemic, there was such an acceleration and need, whether it was online learning or remote work, uh, but also just instrumentation of their businesses to be more uh, competitive and more effective. And so, you know, Microsoft's been part of that whole commercial world for a long time. And, um, you know, we're seeing companies really think about uh, I mean, one of the stats I saw was that a typical automotive company has like 1% of their employees are software engineers. And at like Tesla, it's about 7% of employees are software engineers. And so we're seeing companies become much more tech oriented. Um, and in fact, I mentor a lot of uh, Boston University students. And one of the things they always ask me is, how do I get into tech? And it's like, well, you already are in tech. I mean, any company you work at these days needs to use software and and hardware to sort of drive their business and so i think microsoft especially with azure uh has been part of that and helping companies kind of rethink their operations and their field and their instrumentation and telemetry and that's kind of the stuff we'll maybe talk about today and how do we use ai to help make better business decisions and so that's been a huge part of microsoft's business especially the past decade um and like i said the tech is now coming together where a lot of the great ideas people had, uh, you can actually do them. So, uh, so I'm kind of excited about, you know, not only the, the history of Microsoft is pretty awesome, uh, but the next probably decade or 20 years, I mean, it's going to be amazing because there's just a lot of work to do and a lot of cool tech to play with. And I think Microsoft's in a good position to, to help folks with that. So that's good. 100% agree with everything you just said. In fact, I want to resonate that point. You know, companies, even, even us at ARM, right? I mean, we've talked about this on the stream before, anyone who's seen us talk about this. But, you know, when the pandemic hit, uh, my ex-co-host, Alessandro Grande, who's, who's obviously not here anymore, but he and I sat together and we were like, we can't go to events anymore. How are we going to right. engage? How are we going to talk with our developers? How are we going to, you know, like create content and push it out there? We're not shaking hands and, and hanging out with people at events anymore. And so yeah. then, you know, the ARM Innovation Coffee live stream is born, right? And I think mm -hmm. that you may have been in a similar situation with your IoT Unicorn podcast. Right. So, right. so you know, definitely companies finding new ways to kind of get into this digital, digital well, format. You know, I think it's been actually a boon for developers, too, because I know, like, with our build conference, which is traditionally, you know, get a ticket and go to Orlando or something like that. Um, you know, it's expensive, it's hard, it's not easy, you know, it's very difficult for a lot of developers in different parts of the world to be able to do that. And now that the, you know, the pandemic sort of forced, forced us to be a lot more virtual, frankly, a lot more inclusive, right? So if you're a developer, you know, on the North Pole, I mean, whatever, you can, you can go to build, right? And yeah. you can be part of that and you can learn and you can contribute and you don't need a ticket to Orlando. And so I think that's pretty cool. Uh, so I think we've learned how to make events a lot more inclusive and especially for developers and, you know, the diversity of folks out there that want to contribute and create. And uh, maybe they're in some area or some circumstance where it's hard for them to sort of travel to Redmond or something, which, yeah. you know, uh, and now with the, the the more virtual, you know, things like this, this show and virtual events. Oh, wow. It's amazing. Like people can just be engaged from anywhere. And uh, hopefully that sticks. So hopefully we keep keep that muscle strong the the events need to stay hybrid so they can go right. back to in person but they need to keep the things that they've learned through the pandemic and maintain some sort of hybrid right. nature i think that will be the most inclusive and amazing way to to proceed yeah. and go forward yeah. so the other the other thing by the way that i thought was pretty cool out of this was the 
uh, you know, we have all these meetings going on and, you know, they all were virtual. And I don't remember way back in the day when we had in-person meetings, um, a lot of interesting interpersonal dynamics when people get into a room about who's talking and who isn't talking. And, um, and maybe there is someone on the phone and you forgot to dial in. And so they didn't get connected. And so now at least these, these meetings become a lot more of a level playing field, you know, yeah. for participants to be, to get their voice heard and to be part of the meeting because everyone's just a square on the screen. There isn't one person in the middle of the table, you know, talking and everyone else is like checking their email on the side of the table. So like the, it, I think it'll be interesting to see over the next few years, like what some of these habits that stick that enable us to be a little more kind of inclusive of different voices and things. So I think that was hundred cool. percent. Yeah, no, of course, of course, definitely. Um, and then, and then on the, the flip side, there's also the zoom burnout, right? Which you hear some people yeah. talking about. Yeah. yeah. Uh, cool. Well, Pete, let's, yeah, let's end that on a, on a negative note, you know? Yeah. <laughs> burnout. Yeah. No, but uh, cool. So let's let's move on to the Edge AI and Microsoft yeah. Azure Edge AI. So this is kind of like the segment where we get to talk about these things. And I'm going to start this one off or this segment off with with let's say I think it's an easy question. So how do you see AI impacting the future of our industry? And most importantly, what about Edge AI? Yeah. So AI. I mean, Microsoft's been involved in AI for you know a decade or more. It's one of those technologies that, like I said. It's been around for a long time, but you needed a certain amount of compute horsepower and network capability to really make it work practically. And uh, in fact, it's been around for decades. Um, and uh, But only in the last 10 years, maybe, there's been enough horsepower to make it work. And so AI is kind of one of those transformational things. I think we're still sort of understanding how impactful it's going to be. I know We know it's big and we know it's uh, a game changer. It's almost like the, it's almost like the transformation of transformations, right? It's like, it's enabling all kinds of new things to happen that we didn't even think about before. So so it's hard to overstate the importance of AI in, in how businesses are gonna be run and, and all kinds of things that are happening. So then, so that's great. So we got all this horsepower in the cloud and it's infinite elastic horsepower and we're doing crazy AI model crunching. But then it's like, well, what about the edge? Well, how do we do AI on the edge? And what are the new challenges that are introduced uh, when we want to do things on the edge? And it turns out there is a lot of friction there. Uh, as you know, coming from ARM, you know, you need the requisite horsepower. Uh, you need to do it within a certain power envelope. Uh, you have security issues. Uh, you have manageability issues, provisioning. You know, how do I update those ML models? How do I keep the ML models secure? Because now that's like super important IP. Like if I have developed a model and I'm a... Uh, excavating company, and I've developed a model to recognize granite or some sort of, you know, uh, you know, mining loads or whatever. That's like my IP, and I don't want that ML model in the open internet. Uh, so, so Edge introduces like a lot of really challenging problems. Uh, and what we found was that um, our customers, again, great ideas. CEO comes in, and is like, I want to know how all these turbines are doing, and I want to wear a whole lens, and I want to do a lot. Great. So but then you go do it, right? And you run into all these roadblocks. And uh, and that's what we found was like, our customers had great ideas, there was a great demand, but there's too many, too much, um, you know, basically too, almost too many Lego pieces to put together, right? It's kind of like, uh, I don't know if you're into Legos, I was always into Legos, but there's like, back in the day, you just got a big bag of Legos, right? Or a big box of Legos. There's no instructions, there's no, and, you know, sure, you can build some stuff, but it's never going to look like the Death Star that you saw in the box unless you have, like, the step-by-step -step instructions. And so... Have you seen Gen 4 Legos, though? I mean, those things are... Yeah. <laughs> they're pretty crazy. Pretty crazy. Yeah. yeah. So it's sort of like what we found with Edge AI is, like, we our customers needed a lot more end-to-end uh, -end blueprints, a lot more, uh, you know, here's how all these pieces fit together uh, so that they could... Spent, instead of spending, you know, two years with a dozen PhDs to recognize a can of soup, they could, you know, within a few hours, basically validate some of their POCs and start start getting going and then maybe turn that into a six month project instead of a two year project. And so yeah. that that's kind of the essence of what we've been focusing on. Yeah, it's. It's funny, you know, you mentioned security, like one of the biggest things for me, all the stuff you mentioned, of course, I totally agree with. There's one one thing that I think about when I think of Edge, 
devices, like edge devices doing things, right? And in this case, of course, AI. These these are for all intensive purposes at the edge where people can interact with them. Whereas, you know, when you're talking about like, you know, doing stuff in the cloud, they're in like locked server sure. rooms. And, yeah. and also the hardware is somewhat more constricted, more con more confined. It's There's sure. less derivations of it, right? Whereas when you get to the edge, there's hundreds of different edge yeah. devices. There's tons of different SOCs you can choose from. And so security at the edge becomes a very big deal. You know, yeah. you need to make sure that the device you choose is chosen very carefully and that it's supported very well because mm -hmm. otherwise you could be in for a world of hurt. And yeah. so, yeah. Well, like the physical security, you know, that's an, that's something people don't really think about. You're right. I mean, people can just take that box and walk away with it. Yeah. Uh, we're, we're working with a, a company right now and that's like, well, we can't just kind of stick this box on this thing because someone's going to come in and unplug it and take it. Um, and so, you know, how do you secure it physically and also from tampering, right? So you can't just have some exposed USB port out there in the, in the, in the supermarket. Or serial have, console. Yeah, I mean, you can't do that. So, you know, and uh, so there's physical security and then, yeah, all the digital security that we've heard about. We've heard, you know, there's an anecdote. It's a true story, but there was a, um, a digital thermometer. It was like a Wi-Fi thermometer that was in a fish tank in a casino. And uh, and it was on the the casino Wi-Fi, but it was kind of it was uh, it was exposed, and so someone used the was able to sort of access the SSID and credentials from that thermometer to get into the casino's network and get a list of their high rollers, uh, you know, and basically crack into the security of the whole casino through this little uh, you know Wi-Fi thermometer that was in a fish tank in a restaurant, and so when you add all these edge devices into your system. Right, you have to make sure that the network access and everything is really locked down because those will be sort of the weakest points that that hackers are trying to get in on. Straight, straight out of Mr. Robot, right there. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> it's, it sounds like a scene from a movie, but it's yeah. like a real thing. So, yeah. And so you know, what, like you know, whether we're doing like uh, discrete TPM or FTPM or any kind of like encryption, uh, that's pretty fundamental. And we, you know, using Azure Sphere, which is one of our products. And I don't want to get into like big product pitch, but um, we have lots of ways at Microsoft of helping customers with this problem. <laughs> nice. That's good to know. Good to know. So call Pete. <laughs> yeah. We'll <laughs> there you it. go. Awesome. All right. So next question here I have for you. Oops. Uh, what are the opportunities? I mean, you know, we talked about security. You listed a whole bunch of them. What are the yeah. opportunities and challenges developers are facing today? What, what are some things that you might be able to either point developers at an opportunity or stray them away from a challenge? <laughs> yeah. So I think um, one of the things we found was that anytime there's kind of this um, uh, innovation, we're in the beginning of an innovation cycle, there's a lot of fragmentation, right? And that's good, actually, uh, because you want people to be experimenting and doing kind of crazy things uh, because they want to figure out cool ways of doing things. You know, as the technology matures, maybe as the, the lava cools, uh, things get a little more standardized and there's more sort of, um, you know, uh, common ways of accessing the tech. And so I think we're still in the, uh, the lava is still bubbling part of HAI. Um, and so I think developers are looking at different tool chains, right? I mean, you've got some great platforms out there from NVIDIA and from Intel and from NXP and from you know, Google to, I mean, there's all kinds of cool tool chains out there. So I think sometimes it's challenging because in some of these like commercial deployments, you may have multiple devices deployed, right? You might have some cameras and some gateways and some environmental sensors. And, you know, if all those are running different kind of AI models with different tool chains, you know, how do I, how do I deal with that? You know, I don't want to become a data scientist. I'm an embedded developer. I don't want to be a data scientist. And so, I think that's one challenge that, that uh, developers are facing. Uh, it's just kind of this proliferation of tool chains and endpoints. Uh, there's also the whole issue of just uh, keeping the devices up to date. Uh, so there's actually, you know, one, one, one key point is, you know, how do I push new ML models to the edge? Uh, but also just more fundamentally, how do I just keep the software up to date on this kind of, as you mentioned, sort of heterogeneous universe of interesting devices that are out there, right? Some of them are RTOS based and some of them are running Linux and you know all kinds of things out there. So the, you know, how do I push updates? And and that that's just a, a simple thing 
that we've all been doing in other platforms for decades is like really challenging in the edge AI space. So that kind of the manageability and also the development of, of AI models and deployment of those and, and optimization of those, those are two big, two big things I think that are slowing down a lot of uh, developers these days. I, I got to say, I love the analogy you used. Um, I've always looked at, you know, I, I've never been able to kind of put it into the words that you put it into with the fragmentation at an initial phase, right? So like when this new innovation is coming to the scene, there's so much fragmentation. And yeah. you looked at it as lava, lava boiling to lava cooling. Then you have these right. standards that you can eventually build upon. You can't build yeah. something on, you know, sand. You need some stone, right? And right. so um, I, I love that. I think that that's really cool. Uh, so you know, looking at this, this big innovative space with so many choices and so many things happening, what is Microsoft Azure Edge, you know, what's the latest that Microsoft Azure Edge is offering? How, how are, how are you helping customers approach these yeah. challenges? So one of the things is we are very customer obsessed, but we're also very developer focused and trying to provide developers with a pretty consistent fabric uh, to code against and you know, make sure that that workload that you need to execute can execute either on the cloud or on the edge and, and try to um, simplify that as a developer, you know, so that you don't have to you know, recode and you know, retune for every particular edge device. And so we've got a number of different frameworks uh, on Azure to do that, whether it's you know, within containers and IoT edge. But one of the cool things that we announced back in March uh, was something called Azure Percept and happy to chat about that a little bit. Um, and what that is, is really an end-to-end -end system to help people develop and deploy uh, edge AI solutions. And uh, you can see the little URL there. So we started shipping a dev kit. Oh, here's my little dev kit. I'll show it again. Um, and it's pretty cool. And you know, we started shipping it in March, or we announced it in March, started shipping it. And really what it's designed to be is like some reference hardware, right? So AI vision, some audio, cognitive services hardware. And, and a carrier board, and as well as what we call Azure Percept Studio. And that's kind of a front end that pulls together a lot of Azure services, helps you, and it comes with a bunch of AI models out of the box, but you can bring your own models as well. And so you can really pretty quickly, I mean, like within like 30 minutes, um, power up and construct and execute against some pretty cool uh, AI POCs. And one of the neat things we've seen uh, is there's a ton of interesting uh, developers out there telling their story with Azure Percept, uh, whether it's, you know, we had someone doing a sushi cam so they could recognize different sushi that was rotating around. I love sushi. Um, we had someone <laughs> building a Lego vehicle that was doing object detection using the Azure Eye, uh, the vision part. So developers are taking this stuff, and the idea is Percept, as I mentioned, like kind of takes the friction out of developing and deploying these things and, you know, kind of gets you on the road to a POC that's, you know, it's like 80 or 90% there. Um, and one of the, one of the neat things about it, and we encourage people to get dev kits, you know, it's sort of like the dynamic is at Microsoft, we sell into all these fortune 500 companies. And I've been to these exec reviews where you've got the CEO of some big company and, uh, and they want to do something really cool, but they know it's complicated. So if you as a developer get this kit, like you can show your boss within an hour, something really cool. And so you will be the hero uh, and you will get promoted. <laughs> if you can get this thing, you'll get this thing, you'll get it up and running, your boss will be impressed. And, um, and it's sort of like, oh, you know, it's actually not that hard to get going and start to do object detection or people detection or spatial analysis or these other things that seem really complicated. But now with Azure Percept, we sort of simplified it a little bit uh, quite a bit. And so you can get going. So sort of like from a personal motivation perspective, you know, developers are excited by two things, either uh, fame and fortune, uh, fame or fortune, basically those two things, right? So with the dev kit, you can become famous and also impress your boss. Uh, and so it's kind of a, a, a two bang shot there, which is pretty exciting. That that's that That's the new slogan, Azure Percept, get promoted. Get promoted, yeah. <laughs> Asterisk, really cool. not guarantee. <laughs> your mileage may vary. See you with the details, yeah. But, yeah, uh, we'll, we'll say that part really fast. Yes, oh, exactly. Yeah. So now that you brought up Azure Percept, I'm going to go to the beginning of our YouTube chat where someone, one of our esteemed here uh, community members, Arjit, asked a question. 
Cool. So we have right here, I'm here to ask Pete one important question. Azure Percept Dev Kit VS versus oh, that's I see. <laughs> versus the MediaTek based Microsoft Dev Kit. Which one do you think is more capable of stuff like TinyML? Yes. So TinyML, so you, you kind of, that was the key word there at the end. TinyML is really cool because it's all about doing AI models on really kind of Cortex M based edge points, right? So the dev kit currently is a Cortex A based endpoint, right? So we got a, we have an Intel uh, Myriad X chip on here and we have a NXP IMX 8M in here. So, uh, so this is not really a TinyML platform, uh, not yet. So not to pre-announce anything, but not yet. So the MediaTek stuff that we have that I think you're probably referring to the Azure Sphere dev kit with MediaTek, um, that's pretty cool for doing TinyML. Um, and there's lots of other platforms you can do on that. But that, so currently this is this is, this is is not a TinyML platform. So if you're really into TinyML, um, the MediaTek one's probably a good one to, to play around with. Awesome. I, I'm pretty sure that answers your question, Arjit, but if it doesn't, go ahead and comment something yeah. else in, in the chat there. This one is, I think, more of a, I want to say, maybe maybe personal, but also just kind of wondering okay. based on your expertise here. It comes from Cloud Love. It, it's off topic slightly, but do you see LTENB taking over Laura oh. Sigfox? This is a topic near and dear to my heart. So I don't know if you can see behind me, but there's a an old AT&T Bell telephone sign there. Well, you uh, there. there it is. Yes. And oh, nice. so, okay. you know, so I've been working in the telecom world for probably a couple of decades. And I have that sign there to remind me that telcos have been around for like 100 years and uh, and they keep their networks running 24 seven. And there's kind of almost nothing more exciting other than edge AI than things like 5G and LPWA. And so when this person is talking about LTNB and Lauren Sigfox, they all fall in that LPWA uh, bucket, which is all about low power wireless access. And so that means, you know, using milliwatts of power to send hundreds of kilobytes over the air, as opposed to, you know, 5G, which is, you know, basically crushing it with huge payloads. Um, and so it's a good question, because there's lots of different ways to vibrate the air, as we say, uh, especially in the LPWA space. And so um, there's, you can sort of break it down into licensed and unlicensed spectrum, right? So in licensed spectrum, which, you know, you think of as like, uh, you know, telcos, Verizon's and Vodafone's and stuff, and they, they, they bid on spectrum and they own it and they do stuff. And it's really great, high quality of service, guaranteed stuff. And LT, LTEM, uh, uh, so I think that's kind of what they're referring to, LTEM or NBIOT, uh, narrowband IoT uh, operates in that license space. And it's, it's a great solution. Uh, especially for like uh, parking meters, metering, anything that needs like a little bit of message of data every so often saying, here's what's going on, moisture sensors and agriculture and stuff like that. Um, and then there's unlicensed spectrum um, and that varies by geography. And that's where you have things like LoRa and Sigfox and like Wi-Fi would be there too. Um, and so those are cool too, because those, you know, things like I have a LoRaWAN sensor. Oh, I don't have it out right now, but I have a LoRaWAN thing in my house and I have motion sensors in my house that do different things. And uh, you can get some super long propagation of these sensors to a little hub uh, over unlicensed spectrum. And th that's great for like buildings and other kinds of things where you wanna connect things wirelessly over a you know pretty far distance. Um, so so I guess by the short answer is I don't see it taking over. I think it's like in the UK, they say horses for courses. Uh, so depending on the problem you want to solve, you can solve it through NBIOT or LTM, or you can solve it through LoRa and Sigfox. It just sort of depends on what your parameters are and the problem you're trying to solve. So very long answer to a very short question. Learned, I learned a lot though, so that's awesome. <laughs> cool. Um, so I, I think Pete, we've talked about you know Azure, Azure Percept. I think it's time to do our demo. You you have a pretty yeah, good demo to show. Yeah, let's that do okay? it. So. Let me do a little uh, intro before we go to the clip. Um, the uh, So Yuha on my team uh, has been working on something really interesting, which is the intersection of 5G and Edge AI. And so the Azure Percept kit, uh, he has this kit and we've been working on uh, integrating 5G with that. And so we're gonna show a little demo of that working uh, as of yesterday. 
Um, and he has it out in his house uh, uh, a little north of uh, Seattle. So why don't we see what, see what that looks like? Let's roll the clip and I'm going to click on it right now. So you can go ahead and talk over this clip. Okay. Oh, there you go. So here we have Azure Percept uh, ready for 5G. So uh, we have the uh, Azure Dev Kit here. We have the eye, the actual sensor, AI acceleration, and then we have a 5G Ethernet gateway here that is simply connected over an Ethernet cable to the dev kit. And this will allow us to access the 5G networks all over the globe. And here we go. So this is, uh, so Yuha has this set up. So he's going to show uh, Azure Percept Studio, which I mentioned, which is kind of this front end to all this edge AI stuff. Uh, and what's cool about it is you can get up and running super quickly. Um, you know, you can provision your devices and then what you can do is pick your AI models. Um, and so he's going to pick some of the sample models that come with and, uh, and push those models to his device over 5G. Uh, so vehicle detection is a common one and you'll see him do that, uh, which is pretty cool. And you can bring your own models and import them in. So there's like kind of an infinite there. Uh, the cool thing is the ML ops though, being able to push those securely to the endpoint. So now he's going to look at the, the video coming in from the device. So uh, it's kind of facing out uh, into the street. And so it's recognizing a bicycle and some cars. And soon we'll see a little bit of action here on the street. Um, and so the other cool thing you can do is you can take the real time telemetry uh, from the device coming into uh, Azure Percept Studio. So um, you can do all kinds of, you can then wire that up, all of the uh, telemetry that's coming in, wire that up to a dashboard or uh, some power apps or notifications or alerts. Uh, you can even do like a Teams notification on a desktop or something on a phone, all based on this stream. So you're getting the real time stream, you can see the truck going by um, and recognizing the truck versus the bicycle versus the car. Uh, the other thing you can do is train these models uh, to do all kinds of other object detection. There's somebody on a bicycle going by. Uh, so really simple to kind of get up and running. And what's cool about this is now we're able to do this over 5G. And we can talk a little bit about what that means, but that means basically deploying it anywhere um, without cables or wires and stuff like that. Oh, there's a truck and there's another, truck, another car. Uh, so pretty simple, uh, pretty simple demo, but really kind of powerful in that you can quickly and easily get this stuff up and running and using Percept Studio to kind of do all that. So do you offer, do you, that was, that was awesome, by the way, uh, yeah. really cool. And now you, everyone can see the capabilities of this AI dev kit. Um, do, do you offer those kind of example, that example source code for people to consume yeah. and, and just kind of like get up and running just as a practice run? Like, okay, my kit works kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And so there's a bunch of AI models that come with, and what's cool about Percept is that we will do the model optimization depending on the endpoint. So we will we will help kind of uh, get it kind of compiled and optimized. And so you don't have to be sort of in the under the hood with the tool chains as much. And that's one of the things we're working on with ARM. In fact, we announced that with you guys probably six months ago is how we're integrating some of the ARM AI tool chain work into Percept Studio. So regardless of endpoint, the developer has a pretty consistent experience. And then if you go up on GitHub, there's a bunch of samples there as well. Um, pretty much everything you need, like I said, to, to be the hero and uh, to do something cool for your boss. But the idea behind Percept and um, is that we can get to POCs quickly, but then take those POCs out into the wild and deploy the, the these dev kits, you know, out in a store or you know, we have some partners that have weatherized containers for these things, and then you know. Uh, execute your proof of concept, get all your data back, have all your AI models trained. And then when you're ready to go to production, you know, we have partners building production devices based on these hardware blueprints, right? Keep all your code the same. You've already done, you've done the hard work, right? You've got, you've got the whole thing working end to end. Just get your production devices going and then you can actually then get to production without having to basically start over. Because um, previously what would happen is you do a POC, you'd kind of gin it up, you know, kind of bare metal, um, and then once you got it all working, then your boss is like, okay, let's ship it. And it's like, okay, well, let me start over again and retrain my models and actually get the real hardware and do the whole thing over again. 
you don't have to do that with Percept. You can actually go from POC to production super quickly. A lot of people end up with those issues when they don't they don't uh, assess the supply chain well enough when they're developing right. stuff. Um, you end up with those issues as well. So uh, another question came in from Cloud Love, mm -hmm. and and I mean I think that we didn't talk about this actually. So when people if people want to get this dev kit, let's let's address this question while also talking about how do you get this dev kit, right? Yes. So he's wondering if the dev kit is available to purchase <laughs> outside of. US and he's referring to Mexico, but maybe you could just tell yes. us in general, how do you get the dev kit and so, where is it available? Yeah. So if you go to that URL, get Azure Percept, uh, you can buy the dev kit. Now we are adding lots of countries to that list. Uh, and I don't know all the countries off the top of my head. I know there's a lot in Europe, US, North America, and we're, you know, and I think we're shipping in Asia and some, some countries. So there's a process to add those kind of one at a time or a chunk at a time based on certifications and, you know, other issues. Um, so we are we are adding them as fast as we can. Uh, I would say right now uh, demand maybe is outstripping supply a little bit, which is not a bad problem to have. But yeah, definitely send us feedback. Um, and we, uh, you know, like I said, we're we have a whole team, a certification team, working as fast as we can to add as many countries as quickly as possible. Nice. Okay. Well, hopefully that answers your question there, Cloud Love. Um, and. You got that going. We're going to share that. We'll share that link to 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 the dev kit yeah. uh, one more time. But also, you know, if you're watching this on demand, just check the description out because we put all the yeah. links that we share throughout the stream inside the description cool. there. By the um, way, I think that was the first time we had demo Percept on 5G. So I think we we uh, premiered something on your show. So that was Pete, when we do that, we have to look into the camera and go, you saw it here first. Saw it here first. There you go. <laughs> all right, cool. There you go. You saw it here first. Awesome. Um, so I have I have a, a more questions here. I know we're coming up on about 10, 12 minutes till close. Okay. And we want to give you some time at the end to, 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 to plug something. But this question here, we're, we're kind of going still on the edge AI uh, se segment here. Yeah. At, the, at, at the start of the year, you were on an industry panel at the Tiny ML Summit discussing the challenges and opportunities for AI on microcontrollers. And the question is, what do you see as the biggest challenge for MCU developers building AI applications? So yeah. I think we're going now from like bigger devices down to the MCU devices. Right. And, you know, so our vision is to have a support, a portfolio of endpoints, right? From Cortex M single milliwatts up to heavy edge. You know, we haven't talked about heavy edge equipment yet too, but you know, Azure stack and, and other big boxes. Um, and so that's, that's, that's the road that we're on. I would say the MCU Cortex M space is like super nascent uh, and and uh, very bubbly lava at this point <laughs> to use that metaphor. Uh, and so Tiny ML is an organization that we're involved with to help you know bring a little bit of um, structure to that world. Um, but you know the challenge is there. Yeah, it's there's a lot of fragmentation. There's a lot of tool chains. There's a lot of heterogeneity on the endpoints. I mean, one of the things we're doing is to help there is working with ARM uh, because a lot of the silicon partners out there that are building Cortex-M based are using ARM uh, AI accelerations uh, IP. And so if we can sort of solve for that and say, well, as long as you're using the ARM AI acceleration in your Cortex-M, then, you know, Percept will work, you know, with a couple of clicks. That's kind of what we're trying to do to help there. Um, but it is kind of the wild west uh, in terms of uh, in terms of edge. It's the edgiest part of edge AI, I would say. Yeah, I'm glad you actually touched on the whole you know partnership between Microsoft and ARM on this particular aspect. And you know we won't be able to cover all of that, but you can go read it in this this yeah. blog down here or this 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 uh, good. It's a good read um, yeah. at techcommunity.microsoft.com forward slash all that stuff. Again, it will be in the description if you want to check back later when this goes on demand. Um, awesome. Very awesome. Um, so you kind of talked about what Microsoft is doing here. Uh -huh. So we were talking about, you know, what are the biggest challenges for MCU developers? You kind of touched on what Microsoft is doing in this space. If you'd like to elaborate more along with this question here, um, okay. what specific R and D breakthroughs are you seeing that will open up the opportunities for AI in this space? Well, I think on the hardware side, I mean, I got to hand it to our Silicon partners. They're doing some amazing things in terms of accelerating AI models. Um, and I think one of the really challenging areas is how to do that within a very re restrictive power envelope and cost envelope, right? Uh, and so we're seeing some amazing things going back to the tiny ML statement, you know, and, and even for Cortex-A based things like 
just uh, the kind of year over year, generation over generation ability to execute more complex models. So for example, like on a very high end, you know, a spatial analysis model requires quite a bit of tops, quite a bit of horsepower. Um, you know, you can't run that on an MCU today, but you know, over the next five years, I think we'll see Silicon Partners doing some incredible stuff there. Um, I think the other thing that's happening, maybe I'm a little biased, but I think the uh, rollout of 5G and LPWA for commercial, you know, kind of M to M solutions is going to be a real game changer. Um, so we're going to see like ultra low latency, single millisecond networks uh, connecting cloud and edge and all these really interesting topologies. One of the pieces of feedback we've heard from customers is um, going back to your earlier point, we want to minimize the amount of hardware on prem. Right. So you don't want to have a box there that somebody may want to kind of yank off the wall and take with them or whatever. Uh, and if I could use a 5G network to connect my sensors, you know, directly to the cloud and keep my on-prem hardware cheap and, and you know, minimal, I now I can use some high performance networking to do that. So the like 3GPP release 16 stuff was approved last year. So that's just starting to get out there. So I think that's another vector along with the silicon that we'll see that'll be, you know, one of those big enablers uh, for all kinds of new solutions. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you so much for the answer there. Um, so I am out of questions. However, we do have a few questions here that came in from the audience That's and good. we'll address those and then we can kind of go into our last plug and close out okay. the, the episode here. Sounds so good. this one comes in from David W. Uh, Amazon sells AWS Racer, NVIDIA, the Jet, the, the Jet Racer, small scale autonomous mobility learning kits. Will we see an Azure Percept racer? And just so you know, David W., he's one of our, our longtime community members. He is okay. very into autonomous. So I guess kind of let's also trickle in this for him. You know, what kind of autonomous stuff, autonomous mo autonomous mobility stuff might you be able to do with this a a a Azure kit? Yeah, so I, I think the current kit, you can do some basic stuff, right? You know, object detection and obstacle avoidance and some other things. Um, you know, and, you know, we have a, a pretty robust robotics platform at Microsoft as well, um, you know, supporting the whole ROS infrastructure. And so, yeah, I, I expect over time, like, we'll just keep innovating there and keep adding more capabilities uh, to the Percept platform and to our ROS platform to enable these kind of things. So, yeah, I think it's inevitable that we'll get there. I don't have anything to, more specific to talk about today, but we're certainly on that path. Awesome. Great. Thank you. Um, then this one comes in from Sandeep Mystery. What OS does this Azure Percept kit use? Yes, good question. So um, so this kit runs Linux, so pretty straightforward. Uh, it's actually uh, what we call Mariner Linux, which is kind of our distro based on CentOS. Um, but, you know, the nice thing is uh, Percept endpoints can run Ubuntu Linux. They can run, you know, uh, even run uh, Percept workloads inside of uh, what we call eFlow. So we announced something yesterday um, called uh, um, uh, for Linux on Windows. I'm trying to remember it. Embedded for Linux on Windows, but basically running Linux workloads on Windows IoT. Uh, so I think you'll see more with Windows IoT in the future as well. But the dev kit itself is just just plain old Linux. Great. Awesome. All right. And so, uh, I mean, this question came in. I, I'm, I'm going to take it because I shot JR as a, a good one. He says, is there a discount code for the viewers? <laughs> that is a good question. I, you know, I think I have my discount code in my other pants. So I okay, to... there you go. So you got it. I shot JR. Discount code in their pants. Maybe we'll talk with Pete later and see if we can do something in the description. But if not, don't get disappointed. It's only 350 bucks. You got it. Yeah. So go, go ahead and pick one up anyway. Think, think of the career investment, you know. Yeah, like exactly. Said, how much is that promotion worth, you know? Yeah. All right, cool. So Pete, this is the time of the episode where we give you an opportunity to provide us, me and our viewers, a shameless plug, anything you'd like to talk about. Shameless and we plug. still have plenty of minutes. So, so whatever you'd like to, to yeah. call to action. Sure. Well, I mean, I think a big call to action right now, we've got these dev kits out there. Uh, it sounds like we need to figure out how to get them into Mexico, but um you know, go, go to the URL, get a dev kit, be a hero. I think that's kind of our call to action for today. And I would also say like, you can go to our YouTube channel, uh, look that up. And uh, we've got some pretty cool examples of, uh, first of all, there's a lot of cool how-to videos on there as well. So 
Uh, my colleague George Moore is on there with some really great kind of hands-on learnings and examples from other developers about what they're doing. Someone published last night, uh, it's like an Alaska Airlines POC. So he had trained his Azure Percept on some toy Alaska airline planes, and then he trained it on the runway. And he was actually able to show like ramp operations and do all kinds of cool stuff with it. So there's a lot of really interesting ideas out there that I would encourage uh, developers to take a look at and get some ideas. And then just, you know, uh, get a kit and talk to us. You know, we're, there's a Reddit, uh, Reddit channel there. There's like a lot of tech community channels from Microsoft. Talk to us, tell us about your ideas, what you want, and uh, let's work together. There you go. Yeah, uh, one of our one of our producers behind the scenes was able to go grab that YouTube channel ah. real quick. So there you go. Um, though that's going to be really hard. You're probably off just better searching it. <laughs> yeah, that's a tough one to type in. I was going to say. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so very cool. I want to add this one for you here, Pete, because I mean, I just yeah. recently followed you literally today, and I was scoping yeah. your your Twitter channel. Um, you know, a lot of people, what it's, it's usually like kind of heavily leaning towards retweets. You actually post your own stuff. And if you're retweeting, you're retweeting it with a comment. So, I mean, I have a lot of respect for people who, Thank who you. have a, have a, a thorough Twitter feed like Pete's right here. So go Thank check you. out digital dad, digital dad. Oh, my microphone stands blocking. Go there check that go. out. Uh, he's got a really good, cool. good, good feed to follow. So definitely recommend awesome. that. Appreciate yeah. that. So this is it. Pete, okay. Gosh, you know, thank you so much for your time. I know it's valuable. Yeah. We really appreciate you coming here. So yeah, I mean, thank you so much. I'm going to do the outro when, if, if you're okay with that. Yeah, sounds good. Appreciate being here and uh, I'll see you guys around. Awesome. Thank you so much. And everyone right. watching, thank you so much. We'll see you next week. Stay tuned. We'll be updating you on the Arm Software Dev Twitter channel at Arm Software Dev. Don't forget to follow us. If you like the video, hit that like button and subscribe to the Arm Software Developers YouTube channel. We'll see you next week. Let's hit that outro video.